I'm so excited about the episode today. We're launching a mini series. Yes. That you can. Our first mini series, actually. Mini series. I know. I feel like we're I'm Netflix. excited. We have our own mini series. <laughs> um, over the next three weeks, uh, we're gonna we're gonna have a little mini series on toxic behaviors to avoid in marriage, and we're gonna talk about six total over three weeks. So we're gonna talk about two toxic behaviors per week to avoid. And today, the theme is all about words. It's two toxic behavior, behaviors to avoid. Number one, talking badly about your spouse. And number two, letting others talk badly about your spouse. Mm -hmm. And I want to share a few uh, Bible verses on this. Um, Ashley and I have been doing a message on the power of your words, and we've collected some scriptures that speak to this. And I just want to share a few to sort of set the tone, because the Bible has a lot to say about yeah. the power of our words. And I think sometimes we... We neglect this. We think, what's the big deal? Sticks and stones can break my ho my bones, but words can never hurt me. But the truth is, words have power. I mean, think about it. God created the universe with words. He could have created it any way he wanted, but he used words. Then he created us in his image, giving us power in our words to shape the world around us for good or bad, to build up or to tear down. And we've yeah. got to be so careful. So here are a few verses. Proverbs 18, 21. The tongue can bring death or life. Your words have the power of life and death. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 12. I tell you, everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. Mm -hmm. For by your words, you will be acquitted, and by your words, you will be condemned. Man, that's sobering for me because I've said some empty words. I've said some harsh things. And we thankfully, in Christ, we have grace, and we don't have to beat ourselves up and live in shame over our past mistakes. We can embrace His grace and live in freedom. But... That verse should still be a sobering wake-up call that our words matter, and if we've said things we shouldn't have, then we need to apologize, and we need to try to make it right. Here are a few more. Um, Proverbs, again, chapter 16, verse 24, kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul, healthy for the body. I love this from Ephesians chapter 4. Get rid of all bitterness, anger, rage, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. And there are, there's so many more. I mm -hmm. mean, the, we could go on and on and on, but it comes down to, to respect, kindness, tenderness, honesty. And if our words aren't displaying that about our spouse, then we're speaking negative things into existence. We're tearing down our marriage with our words. And if we're letting others speak negatively about our spouse, mm -hmm. we're talking about that as well, um, then we're also culpable. You know, we're, yeah. we're we're letting that happen, and we've got to make sure that those words are just not allowed in our home, about our spouse, in anywhere. It's never appropriate to speak evil and negativity about your spouse. You know, absolutely. And I, I just want to camp out real quick on, because I, I feel like these go hand in hand, these two behaviors, you know, both talking badly about your spouse and letting others talk badly about your spouse, because one affects the other. And here's why. So if you, like, let's say you have a group of friends and they tend to talk maybe negatively about their spouses. And then also, you know, in this conversation of them talking negatively about their spouse, they kind of, you know, say something derogatory about your spouse because they think, oh, we're just friends. We've known each other a long time. We're just shooting the breeze. You know, we're letting it out. We need to have a safe place to, to just, you know, let it all out. But do you guys know that actually studies have shown, there's literal studies that have shown that you kind of justifying speaking negatively about something to vent, that venting itself actually just leads to more anger. And that's actually biblical. But our friend Shanti Feldhahn, I actually just heard her do a talk on this. It was actually about kindness and the power of kind words. And she said that, you know, there's all this research behind, well, does venting actually work? And it, it doesn't. It literally is it like you're worse. taking a match and you're just lighting a line of gasoline. Like maybe you've been yeah. making a line of gasoline this whole time with like negative words, negative words, negative words. And the more you vent, and you, especially when you get among people, it's like you all play off each other. And we play off each other. I'm not just saying you. I mean, we've done this too. Like I get it. I've been that person. I've had to learn the hard way, but it doesn't lead anywhere good. And it just lights this fire inside of you of anger that leads to even more negative thoughts and maybe negative things you say about your spouse. And so I would just challenge you, if you are around people that have traditionally, like in the past, been talking badly about your spouse, the next time they do that, you need to speak up. Like it is so yes. important that you speak up and you say, listen, it's 
I want, you know, forgive me for allowing this to be okay, because it's not even your fault. Like I'm the husband here. I'm the wife here. And I've not said anything in the past about you speaking about badly about my spouse. But listen, I've been really convicted over this. And I, the more I thought about it, the more I realized I don't want my spouse, you know, talking badly to other people about me or allowing other people to talk badly about me. And so I want to, I want to change this dynamic here. Let's start saying only positive things because it's just not, it's really not helping me as a spouse. And if that person is really your friend, they're going to say, you know what? Okay, that sounds good. And I'm so sorry that, that this has caused, you know, friction in your marriage because they would be more concerned about your marriage. But if they're like, man, that's stupid or girl, what are you talking about? We're best friends and we can just say whatever. Then that's not really a good friend, you guys. No, no, it's they, not a good friend. They're wanting permission to, they don't want to change right. venting about their spouse and all that. And they don't want yeah. to be held accountable. And so they, y- you just have to be mindful. Mm-hmm. And maybe like Ashley said, maybe it's time for you to get another friend group or to stop, you yeah. know, going to, to Margarita night right after work and just hanging out and like venting about the husbands or the wives or whatever it is mm-hmm. and do something different. Right. It's going to invest in your marriage. And maybe you're listening to this and you're like, but, you know, my spouse, the one's talking negative to me. Mm, and yeah. what do I do in that situation where it's like, I want to, I, I don't want to just let them walk all over me. And so I find myself being negative in return. Well, here's another Bible verse for you from Proverbs. And I love this. It says, a gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. Mm, and yeah. what the Bible's telling us is the tone of your words is going to shape the tone of your marriage. That when we'll respond to anger with gentleness, then more often than not, it will help diffuse the situation instead of making it worse. But when we feel like, no, no one's going to talk to me that way. And if you're going to get angry with me, I'm going to get angry with you. And it's, it just, it never ends. It's this crazy cycle that never ends. So we've got to be the first one to stop the fighting. We've got to be the first one to say, you know what? I'm, I'm sorry you're angry. And I'm sorry for anything that I did to contribute to that. Um, but I love you, and uh, and I, I I don't want us to fight. I don't want us to have anger in this house. I want it to be a place of laughter and joy and and safety and peace for for both of us and for our kids if we have kids. So what can I do to help you feel safer here? What can I do to and and then really listen yeah. when they start talking? And even and your your instinct might be to get defensive, like what what are you talking about? I don't do that. Well, if I do that, you do this more, and say just listen and say, all right, that's something that I'm going to work on. Mm-hmm. I really want to work on it, and. And try that approach. And maybe you think, well, no, that's that's being weak. Like, no, that's being wise. That's not being weak. That's being wise. And wisdom in your words, wisdom to say, I'm going to apply God's word to the way that I think and talk and act and respond and and just watch what happens because it's timeless and it's powerful. And God's truth is, is always going to put us on the right track. If you're just responding emotionally, which is what happens in a lot of marriage disagreements is like we just let our emotions run wild and we vent like Ashley talked about or we respond in anger. Um, Nothing good comes from that. And if you've been doing that a long time, you already know this to be true. It never leads anywhere good. So try this instead. I mean, you got nothing to lose and I, I promise it will make a positive difference. I want to mention this as well. You know, if we are caught in this negative dynamic of constantly maybe talking badly, you know, about our spouse, whether to them or to other people, there is just this negative tone in our home. And I, I want to just to remind everybody about this. And we have whole podcasts on this if you want to know more. But it takes a lot of positive and encouraging things that you say to your spouse. Like you need to have that in regular practice in order to, when the time is right, to speak, you know, about something concerning to them. For example, like if you, like, let's say there's a behavior that your spouse keeps on doing, like maybe they have said really negative things to you, or maybe there's a bad habit that now has become an addiction, or maybe there's just something that you're really concerned about in their life. If you were already in the habit of encouraging them and of saying nice things to them and about them, then when you do have that issue, when you bring that to them, they're going to listen so much better and more closely because they know you are for them and not against them. But if you're already in the habit of constantly just slinging negative things at each other and going behind their back and, you know, kind of raking them down uh, to your friends and even on social media, this isn't even just in person, but maybe on social media, you complained about them or whatever. When you actually do have an issue that needs to be addressed, they are less likely to listen because they think, you know what? You're always seeing the negative. That's not really my problem. Yeah. It's just because you don't you know, love me anymore. You don't really see the good in me, you know? And so they're not going to listen when really what you have to say might be really a good truth that needs to be addressed. 
Um, and as their spouse, you know, you should be able to speak into that. But if you're if you're caught in this um, dynamic of just negativity all the time, talking badly about each other all the time, there, you know, it, it just causes communication to shut down. And then you're in this spot where you really, it, you have a hard time talking about anything, you know? And so you just kind of have this stalemate kind of, we see, you know, couples just kind of standing there um, far apart, so to speak, and just not really communicating and, and running in circles around each other and living as roommates. And it's really a sad dynamic to be in. Yeah, and, and it's not a place you have to stay. Mm-mm. I think some couples stay there because they think, well, this is just how it is and we don't know how to break out of it. Right. But you break out of it by saying, I'm going to be the one to go first. Yes. And even when I myself might feel hurt or angry or whatever, I'm going to choose to give that pain to God so that I can I can step into the, this role of, of being a healer and saying, Lord, work through me to, to bring about healing and peace in right. our home and in our marriage. And if you think, I don't know how to get there because I feel like, Every time I open my mouth, it's just angry. It's kind of like that movie Inside Out, that Disney Pixar movie. Like, we've got a bunch of kids, and so a lot of our pop culture references are just <laughs> cartoons. But uh, in that movie, and I thought this was a brilliant way to describe it, and they worked with with a lot of like mental health professionals did, to put yeah. this together, that there are emotions in the brain, and one of them is in charge at every every time. And so... Um, that if, if anger is the emotion that's sort of in charge in your brain, then everything you say, even if you don't mean for it to, it's going to come across as angry. Right. And you've got to replace that anger as the main emotion, you know, with with joy, with one of the others. And and that's a process. That's a process. And God's Word talks about how to get there. I think that talking to a Christian counselor can get there because the Bible says it this way. Uh, he said, Jesus said that the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like people are a tube of toothpaste. You know, when you squeeze a tube of toothpaste, whatever's inside comes out. Right. And when we as people, when we get squeezed, it's whatever inside of us is what comes out. So if it's anger and if it's fear and if it's all that inside of us, then anything to squeeze us, all that is going to come out and just reveal what was inside all along. So if you want something else inside, then you've got to do the work of saying, Jesus, come and heal what's broken inside of me. Like, come and bring healing to that which is like broken and distorted in my thinking, in my heart. Renew my mind with your word. Help me to work through the pain of my past. Help me to just help me to do that that work on on a spiritual level to replace what's going haywire inside. Um, and that's that takes courage, guys. But that's the real issue here. We're not just talking about just changing your words if nothing on the inside changes, um, because that's not going to do it, and that's not going to be sustainable. Eventually, we're going to always go back to speaking what the heart is full of. We're saying, let's do the work to get to the root of what's going on inside of my mind and my heart. Mm -hmm. My leb, as Ashley pointed out in a past episode, 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 which is the biblical Hebrew word for both mind and heart together. And I want to do that work. And so maybe for you, that's going to be um, talking to a Christian counselor. If you go to getfaithful.com slash naked marriage, you can get connected to a one-on-one Christian counselor. Um, if you want to talk to somebody here on our team, specifically about the words in your marriage or anything happening in your marriage, you can go to xomarriage.com slash help. We just try to provide resources to let you know you don't have to figure this out alone. Right. And if you've tried on your own and nothing has changed, then it's time. It's time to reach out to somebody else. You know, Talk to somebody who can walk alongside you and, and help you take those next steps to get healing. Absolutely. I actually want to share kind of a personal story, um, especially on the side of letting others talk badly about your spouse, because I think that we can recognize like, oh, yeah, our friends, they shouldn't talk badly about our spouse. You know, I guess I guess I can see that even if they're like, you know, I think we have rationalized it maybe in the past, like, oh, this is a good friend. And we just kind of hash it out with each other. You know, a lot of people can come to the place of recognizing, yeah, that's probably toxic. Maybe we shouldn't talk badly about our spouse to to friends. But I think where it gets really tricky is when it's a family member. I think that um, allowing, you know, family members, close family members, having their opinions about our spouse and shutting that down can be really hard. And I've actually walked this road. I have a close family member that early in our marriage, um, was going through a lot of issues um, herself that I didn't even realize at the time. And I had a codependent relationship with this person. And um, in the beginning, I really allowed her to speak badly about Dave. I did. And I didn't stand up for him. And in my mind, I just thought, well, I can't stand up to this person, like out of respect and out of really the place this person had in my life. And you guys, I'm talking in code because I just don't want to 
crush this person. So I'm trying to right. be very respectful about come this. Along these come a long way. But, but I do want to share it was this. It a devastatingly hard, it was horrible. difficult time because, yes. um, you know, like you said, this this relative herself was at the time dealing with uh, with mental health issues. We didn't realize the extent until later, mm -mm. but um, there was no real accountability around her. No one quite knew how to how to rein that in. And so mm -hmm. we just let her be very, very reckless with, with her words and her actions. Well, not we. It wasn't your responsibility. It was me. Yeah, but and, I mean like everybody in her life, really. Well, that is everybody true. Everybody in her life yes. allowed her to, to just be very reckless with her words and her actions because we... I think all naively thought that that was easier than right. trying to- Don't poke the bear. Yeah, don't poke the bear than yeah. forcing any kind of healthy boundaries. Because um, right. whenever anybody would challenge anything she was doing, then it was just World War III. And so I think in an attempt to be peacemakers, all of us put our heads in the sand and made a lot of mistakes that um, you know reading the book Boundaries would have helped with, which is a book that we which read. Which we did read. And it helped yeah. when we did read it. Great book, by the way, if you're dealing with someone making toxic choices- Boundaries by Dr. John Townsend and Dr. Henry Cloud. Um, but uh, not to interrupt, I'm just reliving that. Like for me, like this was for well, me personally how one of the most difficult times of my entire life. I'd never been treated uh, with the animosity, the anger, the disrespect, the venom and vitriol that was pointed my way for a period of years. Um, and it was just so hard. And I felt, um, I felt alone in that because Ashley, who's always been such a wonderful support, she herself uh, had been sabotaged by the brokenness of this relationship um, with this relative. And so she herself was wounded in ways that I didn't really know how to help. And I was being wounded in ways that she didn't know how to help. Um, we went to counseling, which which did help some, invited this relative to join us in counseling, and which she would not do. Uh, and it, we, it was just a helpless time. We were very young. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't have the life experience that that we have now, but it, at any stage of life, what we went through would have been just incredibly difficult. I think that it is by far the the most difficult thing we've ever walked through in our marriage, and we've we've been through a lot. Um, but this this was next level, and um, and I'm just so thankful that we've we've come through it. But even still, you know, coming through it, uh, there's. There, there's still like some just damaging remnants of that. There's some residue right. that, that um, by God's grace, we're able to work through and have a healthy relationship now. But, but still, that that period of time was so damaging that, um, yeah, I, I just think that we'll we'll live with some of the after effects for that for the rest of our lives. Right, and really, in the sense of God has healed us, and like, thank God, Dave forgave me. Um, for for not standing up for him all those you know for at least a year I think it took me about a year to see the writing on the wall to see really what I was dealing with and I had to go to a counselor it took me going to a counselor and a counselor handing me a book called Emotionally Destructive Relationships I can't remember the author's name but basically that I was in a codependent relationship with this family member and I didn't even know it and um, and honestly to to that person's credit she didn't know it either and there had been years and years of this like yeah. in her own background and so i have such compassion now and i've forgiven this person yeah, and it is by god's grace and dave biting his tongue off and not saying probably everything that he wanted to say in those hard moments but god has has really allowed us to have a really good relationship with um with that family member and i'm just i'm so grateful but let me tell you at the time when it was happening um this person would try to get me alone first of all she would always try to get me alone. And then she would try, basically, um, she didn't like the place that Dave had in my life now that he was my husband and that he was before this person now, you know, because that's how God designed yeah, it. Yeah, by God's design, design of marriage, that's the way it has to be. But she exactly. was not she did not like that. prepared for that. Um, no. And so she had words, you know, and I think not, I don't even know if she realized what she was trying to do, honestly, but it would just be this mind game of trying to, for me to see Dave negatively enough that I would never give him the primary position that right. he was supposed to have never in my life. Never trust me more than you trust her. Right. And, and so trust, whatever could be done to sabotage me or yeah. to weaken the bond of our relationship so that you would turn to her as your primary support. Right. And it was so toxic. I mean, it was, it and it was so hard. Toxic. Yeah, and I felt really, I felt really conflicted because I love this person, but I also love my husband, and I felt often like in between a rock and a hard place. But it took this counselor being like Ashley, this is not healthy, you know. Like, and there are things you can do, and so little by little, Dave and I together as a unified, you know, couple had to set these boundaries in place. And it took me at times on the phone when this person would go into kind of her tirade of just how 
Dave's this and that and names um, with me. And I'd have Dave beside me and he's hearing all of this. I would, I would calmly say, listen, I love you, but you cannot talk about my husband this way. And if you continue to do so, I don't want to do this, but I am going to have to hang up the phone because we cannot continue on this path together this way. Yeah. Because it's hurting my marriage, it's hurting my heart, and frankly, it's wrong. And she didn't like it at first, but little by little, guys, because um, I did have to hang up a time or two, I remember. And yeah. that's not in my nature, you guys. No, I'm non-confrontational. And then, and then you would just cry because you felt I cried like and you, cried and cried. You you were put in this position where you felt like you lost no matter what. And, oh, yeah. And I hated that. And again, it was, it was just a messy season to walk through. It was. And... I'm thankful that we had um, we had some wise mentors speaking into our life through this, and mm-hmm. if that's something you don't have, um, get some healthy voices speaking into your life. Right. I'm thankful for Christian counseling. Um, I went for years. Yeah, I yeah. guys like there are you don't have to figure this out on your own because we couldn't and no. we didn't have to like we we leaned on the the wisdom of of older wiser mentors who had no agenda but but what was best for us and to point us on the path of God's truth and encourage us. We leaned on the wisdom of Christian counselors who had helped. Countless people walk through countless um, family dynamics, and you guys can do the same, right? Mm-hmm. But you have to commit to these principles that we're not going to talk badly about each other. Right. We're not going to talk badly. Let other people talk badly about our spouse because that's toxic, um, and it's just it's so so very hurtful. And if you've gotten caught up in that, it's just time to to turn from that. You mm-hmm. know, to, to let there be a wake-up call. You know, to use kind of a a, a churchy word, but a really powerful one. It means it's the word is repent. Repent, which yeah, means to turn from one way of doing things and turn toward a healthy way of doing things, God's way of doing things. It means like I don't want to do that anymore, and I don't have to. I'm going to turn back to the path of healing that God wants me to be on. And this can be your moment to just say, yeah. Lord, forgive me for how I've spoken and the words that I've said and how I've allowed unhealthy things to happen. And I want to turn from that right now, Lord, embrace your grace and walk in your truth and and experience the healing that you have for me, guys. And so right. um, we could talk a ton more about this. Uh, in fact, we'll we'll talk about lots of other family relational dynamics in this uh, uh, book that we're going to have coming out next year called The In-Law Dilemma, um, because I know a lot of these kinds of relationships do happen within family dynamics. Yes. And so yes. we're going to share a lot of your stories, because many of you have shared your stories with us. But that's our time for that topic. And so yes. it is time to transition into our question of the day. And thank you guys so much for sending in questions at Dave and Ashley Willis on Instagram or um, at nakedmarriagepodcast.com. Wherever you write us, we appreciate it. Uh, today's question says this We've been married for just over a year now, and we waited until marriage to have sex. The issue is my husband can't reach climax from vaginal sex. I thought it would fade over time, but it hasn't. He likes oral sex, but rare, rarely finishes without help from those things. He sometimes just finishes by himself. I feel insecure and like a failure as a woman because I can't please my husband having sex the way God made it. What do I do? Um, thank you so much for your question. Thank you so much for your for honesty. Um, to, to plug a resource real quick before we very specifically try to answer your question, our book, The Counterfeit Climax, which is uh, just new. It's just come out within recent months. Um, getting the audiobook version of that, where we you know, share a lot of stories or, or just the hardcover book, and talking through kind of the questions, reading the stories, I think it would be an encouragement to you or anybody where in any level sex has been kind of a, you know, an issue in your marriage that you're wanting to improve. I feel yeah. like this resource is the, the most sex-specific thing we've ever created, and, uh, and I think it could be really helpful. But to answer your question, first off, um, a lot of don't don't feel like there's something wrong with you. Um, so many folks have written us. So many folks deal with with a struggle where uh, a woman cannot climax by you know vaginal penetration uh, alone through intercourse alone. She'll need some other stimulation, mm-hmm. and and a lot of women have experienced that. And so I'm, just, I'm I know that you're asking about your husband, but I'm just right. flipping it and saying like. Both genders experience these kinds of things, yes. you know, and there are different mm-hmm. there are different factors that can cause kind of like the type of stimulation that's needed to reach cl- climax. Sometimes it's it has to do with kind of the muscle formation in the yep. pelvic floor, which is the base of muscles uh, that that support the the groin area in both men and women. And we've talked to physical therapists to talk about kind of pelvic floor exercises that can sort of loosen up things and and increase the blood flow and do more that's going to help help stimulation lead to climax more naturally. Um, but 
there are so many different factors that can impact this in both men and women. And what you shouldn't ever feel is like, oh my gosh, like I, there's something wrong with me anatomically right. or otherwise because my husband isn't being pleased. It's like just the way that he's wired physiologically, um, certain aspects of, of stimulation that he enjoys, which I'm sure is like very enjoyable during vaginal intercourse, but it might take applying pressure other places in other ways mm -hmm. to kind of bring him to that point of climax. Okay. And, you know, I'd say don't beat your, don't beat him up and don't beat yourself up. If that's the case, right. enjoy every aspect of sex and be thankful that God gives us so much freedom to really explore each other's bodies, explore our own bodies and find what feels best and then help each other in the most intimate and supportive and safest ways possible to, to maximize that pleasure. Right. Um, and I'm just rambling at this point. So no, I'll, but it's so true. And your hand motions are hilarious. Like you're watching, know, he's doing know, all this hand motion this stuff, and Will I'm Ferrell like, scene from uh, Talladega Nights in oh where he's like, I don't know what to do with my hands, and he keeps <laughs> just like doing this. And that's what I'm doing right now. I'm just, I don't know what to do with my hands. It's but. so funny to me, and I'm like, oh, you got. You're if you're right. watching on YouTube, you can enjoy the it's awkwardness. Pretty funny. No, but I mean, you're so right. I want to say this too. I don't know. She wasn't specific about their birth control. Um, kind of what, what they're using. But if they're using condoms, I would say don't use a condom because then there would be more stimulation. But also you might want to consider, um, not that condoms are bad. I'm just saying like if he's not able to get the sensation. No, yeah, no, this, it, it totally. It takes it away. It takes away, right. numbs so much of the stimulation that. Right. Yeah, Especially if he already is not able to have the stimulation. Right, I mean, right. a condom is just a, yet another barrier. So if that's, um, you know, you might want to consider some other forms of birth control if that's your go-to. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I would just say that could be a hurdle that, that you don't have to necessarily get over because there's other ways. I would also say there are sensitivity um you know, different creams and like oils that he may want to use that is supposed to kind of enhance the sensation. I know that like KY um, makes one where it's like a his and hers. That might be something that would really help you guys because I think it draws the blood. If I'm understanding kind of the science behind it, it kind of draws the blood more to the surface and kind of helps with the, the sensation that you're supposed to receive. Well, according to their commercials, it looks very enjoyable for both. <laughs> <laughs> It's supposed to be, but let me just give this little caveat. You might be allergic to it, and we know from experience. So just look at the ingredients. Yeah, yeah. So, yes. but um, natural lubes. That's probably TMI, you know. but but there are natural lubes out there, and, and a lot of people are allergic to that stuff. So just be aware of what the ingredients are in there. But a lot of people aren't allergic to it, obviously, because they keep on advertising it. So it might just be it might just be the ticket yeah. for you. But try um, some coconut oil or coconut saffron. oil, something that makes it um, maybe a more pleasurable experience for you. Um, but also um, maybe spend more time on foreplay. I think that, you know, and I know, you know, a lot of times this is for telling men to do this for women, but I wonder if maybe oral sex should happen before vaginal penetration, I'm sorry, we're, I'm, I feel like I'm like a sex professor over here, but I'm just going to say it like you're it is. So, so hot when you're teaching about sex, like I used I'm, to, I had to teach um, sex ed in middle school. So I feel like it's like that part of me coming out. But anyway, remember that unit I had to teach? It was I, hilarious. I, you said unit. Anyway. Oh my gosh. Okay. So maybe you need to have oral sex. Like, you know, he likes oral sex. Do that before you know, you, he actually reaches climax and then finish with vaginal penetration. And that way you both are getting satisfied and you have that experience of vaginal penetration, but he also has the foreplay needed to right. and, fully enjoy it. And the, the, in, the, the intimate connection that comes when... Um, with intercourse. When, when the, yeah, the climax happens during intercourse. Exactly, yes. And, and you know, climax anytime by any means together if you're experiencing it together is is a beautiful thing but right. um but the, there is something special about that happening happening during and i think that's what she yeah, said she would right. really like like yeah, that's so, what she would really like so i so. think ashley's game plan there but also hey. it's going to take him also being patient with you because you want you both to have pleasure so anyway I, that's probably a lot more information than they were bargaining for no, that's, but we're just why being we're totally here. honest with you guys welcome to the <laughs> naked marriage podcast L led by sex hope you're not listening mom and dad because that was Ashley Willis, <laughs> who's taught this same stuff in middle school. I did not get ways. this. I did not she get did this not, specific she at did all. Not talk about this at the Christian middle school. I talked about waiting and what, how sex is a gift, but this is like we're we're married people. We can talk yeah, about oh it. Oh yeah, I'm glad we yes. can. We can not just talk about it. <laughs> we can do it. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and on that note, guys, we hope you tune in next time <laughs> for our even our producers like this is ridiculous. Um, sorry, Eric. Uh, you guys can tune in I'm next not time sorry, Eric. for. <laughs> <laughs> Tune in next time for the next two 
toxic behaviors to avoid in marriage. So stay tuned next week. We'll see you next time.